Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. New at 6, San Antonio police looking for help tracking a murder suspect in connection with the stabbing northwest of downtown. It's from over the weekend. This is the man police are looking for, 28-year-old Angel Nathan Gonzalez, wanted for the murder of 30-year-old Isaac Aguilar. The stabbing happened Sunday in the 1700 block of Leal Street. Witnesses told police that Gonzalez and Aguilar had gotten into an argument that got heated. Then they say Gonzalez pulled a knife and stabbed Aguilar several times. Aguilar then ran from the scene with a friend and her relative. Anyone with any information asked to call SAPD's homicide unit. That number is 210-207-7635. A new at six, a Bear County jail inmate has died from COVID-19 complications. According to the sheriff's office, this man, 41 year old Donald Hamilton, pronounced dead late last night at Metropolitan Methodist. He'd been in the hospital since September 18th, where we're told he tested positive for COVID. Officials say that he remained there for treatment, though his condition continued to get worse. Hamilton was arrested in August of last year and charged with super aggravated sexual assault of a child and was awaiting trial. The sheriff's office tells us the medical examiner will make the final determination on Hamilton's cause of death. More bad news for CPS Energy. The approval rating of the embattled public utility has now dipped to 44%. That's according to the latest polling from the collaboration between Bearfax, KSAT, and the San Antonio Report. Our Dylan Collier on the mounting criticism of CPS and how the agency has not been able to recover from February's winter blast. The poll gauged the opinions of more than 600 Bear County voters, and CPS Energy's slide continues, dropping from 46% approval during the first quarter of this year to 44% in the latest poll. It's now lost a quarter of its total approval rating in less than a year. Of the local officials and agencies surveyed during the third quarter, CPS's rating came in ahead of only Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, Governor Greg Abbott, and scandal-plagued Attorney General Ken Paxton, who remains in office despite facing a felony securities fraud indictment. Officials with the utility are moving toward proposing a likely double-digit rate increase, its first increase of any amount in eight years, an unpopular move coupled with harsh criticism from its handling of February storm that it just can't seem to shake. They should be operating in, in a way that is transparent and that's in, accountable to the city. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. District 1 Councilman Mario Bravo among the chorus of people saying the public utility needs to be the focus of independent scrutiny, continuing his calls for an outside study on its management structure and corporate culture. You know, let's not just take my word for it. Let's get an outside study done and review their management practices. The release of these polling results comes on the eve of our latest defenders investigation into the utility senior leadership team. Tomorrow on the night beat, the personnel and ethics complaints that hounded Fred Bonniewell before he was promoted this summer to the utilities number two position. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. We're also going to be talking a lot more about this poll in a half hour in our KSAT Q&A. The latest Bearfax KSAT San Antonio report covered a wide range of topics, including Governor Greg Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, some of the new laws from the legislature this year, and our local government, including homelessness. It's coming up in about half an hour in our KSAT Q&A. National Night Out again looks different this year. The annual event held in October in Texas is meant to bring law enforcement and the communities they serve closer together. The San Antonio Police Department has technically transitioned to a similar effort that it calls Neighbors Together, but it was still scheduled before tonight being called off because of COVID-19. But other cities are pushing ahead like out in Converse. Our Garrett Berger joins us live from Converse Park North, where the city and its police department are holding a central event out there this evening, Garrett. Absolutely, no, Converse's police chief tells us there are more than 50 organizations out here there and they're asking people to come down to this location at Park North rather than having the normal community com community gatherings. They are having a few of those and it seems that the word has gotten out. There are hundreds of people here in this crowd. As I mentioned, the chief says they have more than 50 groups coming out for the event tonight to support the community. 
He says this is about showing community members that, quote, teen converse is here for them. And while San Antonio may have officially canceled its Neighbors Together initiative because of COVID numbers, Converse decided to push ahead with its national night out, though the chief says they are taking precautions. COVID numbers are coming down, safety's coming down. Of course, we're gonna ask people to, to mask up if they can. We're out, we're out in the open and uh, just be careful. We decided we we're gonna go ahead and go with it this, this year and, uh, and let's make it happen. Uh, it's time to bring the communities back together. Now, even though the city of San Antonio and its police department technically called off the citywide event, there are still some events happening, like family services drive through event, similar to what the group did last year. Now, SABD says for the most part, though, neighborhoods have postponed their events for this year. It says officers will make a point to stop by the ones that are happening. Well, as you look around the Converse event, you can see that there's a variety of groups that have come out. We've seen churches, businesses, we've seen scouts, there's dancing, there's food, there's a whole bunch of groups out here, a lot of activity happening, and we're not sure exactly how, how big this crowd is going to get as the event will go on for another two hours. Now, live in Converse, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. There was a deadly plan, according to investigators, that revealed in day two of testimony in the murder trial of John Sheringhausen. As Erica Hernandez reports, the medical examiner and the lead detective on the case call the murder a hit. Testimony began with dozens of autopsy photos shown to the jury as the medical examiner took the stand. Between those three gunshot wounds, a lot of injuries uh, are involved. Dr. James Fagg going through each of the 10 gunshot wounds on Anthony Sinks and the eight bullets that were recovered from his body. The manner of death is homicide. And what is the cause of death? The cause of death is gunshot wounds. John Sheringhausen is accused of shooting and killing Sinks on January 2020, the first homicide of the year. Police believe Sheringhausen and Sinks knew each other and had planned to kill another individual. But according to police, Sheringhausen turned on Sinks and killed him instead. This showed us that this was what we would call a hit. Um, it also can indicate to us there might have been more than one shooter involved. SAPD homicide detective Lauren Size spoke more about the evidence collected at the scene that led them to believe that Sheringhausen was the last person to call and text Sinks before he was killed. Those messages discussed a plan between the two to go shoot another unidentified person. I was asking, do you need me to bring the guns or do you, do you have some? He's letting that person that's contacting him know that he does need the guns and he's asking for the information on where the person or target is. The last text message sent to Sank said, quote, I'm outside. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. He has spent time as a political strategist, a political commentator on NBC and other places, and now he's running for lieutenant governor. He has his sights set on Dan Patrick. San Antonio was the first site of his first in-person event for the campaign for Matthew Dowd. Dowd says he made the decision to run after the last Texas legislative sessions. He had become a Republican after being a Democrat when he consulted President George W. Bush. Then he became an independent. Now he's officially switching back after he says Republican lawmakers have abandoned Texans. What happened on January 6th in the insurrection and the response to that and then the Texas legislative sessions and all that, I just felt like I had to stand up and try to do something more than what I was doing. And I thought I could take on that, you know, that task and tell the truth about the politicians in Austin and offer my name up as a way to do that. Dowd hopes to take on Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick next year, but he first has to win the Democratic Party primary where he will face Mike Collier, who narrowly lost to Patrick almost three years ago. More from my one on one interview with Matthew Dowd and where he was visiting tonight on the night beat at 10. Well, in this traffic update, we have some good news on Highway 90 at 36th Street. It has uh, re reopened. If you were with us at 5, we told you about a uh, major rollover crash there. But within the past uh, five minutes or so, those lanes were open. Traffic flowing well. The backup was about five miles all the way back to uh, Highway uh, I-35. Excuse me. So 22 minutes now still from 
I-35 to Loop 1604, some residual delays there. Also watching some delays on the northwest side, I-10 to Bandera Road westbound, 19 minutes, five minutes going the other way. There will be some more construction in that area tonight. We'll have more for on that for you all coming up. Steve, Myra. Thank you, Samuel. Let's move over to our friend Adam Kasky. And what nice weather we had again today. A pleasant start to the day at 61 degrees this morning. And then this afternoon, we just rose 30 degrees, making it up to 91 with a lot of sunshine, of course. Our average high is 86, and we're going to be running above that for the foreseeable future here. Looking outside right now, dew point at 51, that's the key. The low humidity, which is going to be in place for a few more days. Current air temp, 88, wind out of the north northeast at 9. We're 84 in Holotus, 87 Canyon Lake. Pleasant to 91 in Divine, right at 90 degrees, but Del Rio up to 94 along with Catula. Let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. Around sunrise, temperatures upper 50s near 60. So right around 60 here in San Antonio, some mid 50s in the hill country, even just outside of downtown, we'll see some readings in the upper 50s. Timberwood Park 59, 59, as you get on the Leon Springs and Bernie 57. If you like to open your windows that night, you can tonight, just keep in mind, Mold, Fall Elm, and Ragweed are all elevated again today. By tomorrow afternoon, nothing but sunshine and near 90. We'll talk about the rest of the week and when the humidity returns coming up. Just about time now for the first COVID-19 briefing of the week. We've heard for the last several weeks our positivity rate continues to steadily drop. Let's go to City Council, to City Hall right now and listen to the mayor and the county judge. Dr. Claude Jacob, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. We have some more good news this week. According to our weekly progress and warning indicators, we continue to go in a downward trajectory in the number of cases of COVID-19 being reported. In addition, our hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and number of people on ventilators have all decreased even more compared to last week. And uh, some additional good news this week, our positivity rate is 3.9%. Last week, we were at 5.0%. While we do see improvements in hospitals, our overall health system remains uh, in the high stress score. Uh, the overall risk level, however, has decreased to mild for the first time since the week of July 20th, 21. Um, excuse me, 20th, uh, July 20, 2021. So uh, as you can see, your work uh, pays off. It's continuing to pay off. So please keep masking up regardless of your vaccination status. We need to remain uh, vigilant as we continue to move in the right direction. If you're still unsure about getting vaccinated, I encourage you to consult with your health care professional and visit covid19.sanantonio.gov to get answers to your questions. Now let's move on to today's case numbers. Today we're reporting 373 cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day moving average has gone down now to 436. Thankfully, there are no new deaths to report this evening, but we have lost well over 4,500 of loved ones in this community, so please continue to keep them and their families in your prayers. Over in our hospitals tonight, there are 553 patients with COVID-19. There were 56 new admissions um, for COVID-19 within the last 24 hours. 206 folks are in the ICU and 100 are on ventilators. 80% of patients in area hospitals are unvaccinated and 20%, excuse me, 20 patients are children. Again, good numbers to report. Uh, but by no means are we done with this, so please continue to be vigilant and we can continue to keep it moving in the right direction until it's ultimately behind us. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. And I and, uh, want to echo the fact that the numbers are looking really good. Um, of course, we can't let our guard down. Uh, we still have over 550 folks in area hospitals. Um, significantly, 8 out of 10 of those folks in our hospitals are unvaccinated, so still opportunities for folks to get vaccinated both at the city side at the dome, of course, University Health at Wonderland. So we wanna encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, also, we have the convergence of, of flu season uh, coming up here over the next few weeks. Um, also opportunities to get your flu uh, vaccine in addition to your COVID vaccine. There's an opportunity in precinct two in our area, uh, not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday, the 16th at Nelson Wolf Stadium. That's going to be going on all day uh, from about 9 to 2 on October 16th. So if you've not gotten your flu vaccine, 
make sure we don't ignore that this flu season uh, really can exacerbate health issues if you're looking at potentially COVID and uh, the flu. So again, really no excuse, folks. Let's make sure you're getting uh, your COVID vaccine and make plans if you haven't already to get your flu vaccine as well. Um, and of course, keep masking up and staying safe. The numbers are trending great, uh, but we're certainly not out of the woods. and We want to keep uh, our due diligence in making sure that we're being safe out there. So uh, thank you, Mayor. That's all I got. Great. Thank you. And, and as uh, Dr. Jacob says, uh, the holidays like, or excuse me, COVID-19 likes company. And so as we gear up towards the holidays, again, we want to get these numbers as low as possible and the infection rates as low as possible. If you've not received your second dose of your one dose Johnson & Johnson COVID-19, excuse me, if you've not received your second dose of the COVID-19 vaccine or uh, your first dose, which is the only dose of the Johnson Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, you are still eligible to receive a $100 HEB gift card if you visit a Metro Health vaccination clinic to do so. This incentive will be, will be available until supplies last. Your work is paying off. Those are the words of Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight. We are at mild risk, 3.9% the positivity rate. Things are certainly trending in the right direction. And the mayor saying that that's the first time we've seen the risk level in our community drop since the week of July 20th. So definitely uh, encouraging news. You could kind of tell that both the commissioner and the mayor, they seemed a little bit more upbeat than we've yeah. seen in some of these uh, briefings as of late. But still a reminder, not only are there plenty of opportunities to get your COVID-19 vaccine if you haven't, but flu shots are available as well. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to weather right now and talk about the uh, great weather out there. I mean, I am not missing humidity, although I know we need it for rain, but we've we got some rain. We're good. Yeah, we got some rain last week. That was good. Of course, I'd like another splash, but this, if you're not going to have rain, is, I think, ideal outside. Let's get right to it. Take a look at the dew points, and that's the key here. Dew points right down near 50, so not a whole lot of moisture in the air relative to what we're used to around here. Nice break in the mugginess, even closer to the Gulf coastline. This is going to be the case all the way through Saturday, but then by Sunday morning, boom, you'll notice that mugginess right away. If you're an early riser on Sunday, it's going to feel very different from what you had all day on Sunday. Uh, taking a look outside our satellite and radar, quite across Texas. We've got a big disturbance off to our east near Memphis, of course, stirring up a lot of showers and storms over the southeastern U.S. And then also over the desert southwest, another upper level system, a big severe thunderstorm watch box in effect for almost the entire state of Arizona. Of course, they can use the moisture too, but we're wedged in between these two systems and neither of them will be moving overhead. Actually, we've got dry air coming in. This orange color indicates that dry air aloft, and that's one of the main reasons why we're very sunny out there. Just a few clouds strolling through the hill country this afternoon. Tomorrow morning near 60, but I think many locations dipping down into the upper 50s, especially outline areas, and then by the afternoon, more of the same sunny 91 with low humidity. I mentioned before the humidity returns by Sunday. Otherwise, no big changes really other than with the return of the humidity will be warmer mornings back into the upper 60s late weekend and into next week. Thank you, Adam. All right, so the UTSA Roadrunners facing a challenge they maybe haven't faced so far in this undefeated season. Very Texas Tech-like offense called the Air Raid and a quarterback, by the way, from Victoria, Texas. All right, when we come back, Roadrunners will be on the road this weekend. We'll get you ready for the big game, trying to make school history again. And we'll also get you ready for Texas OU weekend. Who's excited? Coming up. UTSA Roadrunners will try and make school history again this season when they go after their sixth win in a row to kick off their 2021 schedule when they face Western Kentucky Hilltoppers on the road this Saturday. They match their best start at 5-0 from the 2012 season with a 24-17 victory over UNLV. Now they're looking to go 6-0 like never before. The Roadrunners come into this matchup as three-and-a-half point underdogs, even though Western Kentucky is 1-3. But don't let the record fool you. They're coming off a 48-31 loss to Michigan State where their quarterback, Billy Zappi, from Victoria, by the way, threw for 488 yards in the loss and has already amassed over 1,700 yards in the air with 16 touchdowns. The Roadrunners know what they're up against. I feel like this is really like the first air raid team I've really seen for real. 
Um, but, you know, they're a great team, like, I, like I've been saying, you know, just as far as the way they run routes, how they mesh well with each other, you know, they, they definitely, you can definitely tell that they, you know, they, they're real, they have real chemistry with each other, you know, they have a real feel for the game. They're all smart players and um, just the way that, you know, that they just move around on the field, you can tell that they're very skilled, uh, you know, in the past game and the quarterback is the head of that and, you know, he does a great job taking control. So it's good. they're going to be a great, you know, a great challenge, especially, like I said, going up there and playing them. So we're going to have to make sure we really prepare and, uh, you know, ready to take on that challenge. All right, kick off at Western Kentucky on Saturday. We'll be at 6 p.m. It's Texas OU weekend. The Red River rivalry is renewed with the Texas Longhorns at 4-1 and one, back in the top 25 in the nation. But the Sooners come into this game undefeated at number 6 in the nation. The Horns are averaging almost 44 points a game with the Sooners 38 and a half. But the Sooners defense is only giving up 19 points a game compared to the Horns 24 in their first five games. As a result, Texas is only a 3.5 point underdog against the 5-0 and o Sooners in the Cotton Bowl. I'm fired up for the game. I mean, you guys know me well enough. I love, uh, I love the pomp and pageantry of, of college football. I love the history. I love the nostalgia. To think this is the 117th time these two schools are meeting, like that's, that's a crazy number, you know. Um, so from that aspect of it, the state fair, I mean, all that stuff, I'm, I'm looking forward to. I, I really try to get there by Saturday. Um, we put in so much work during the week so that we can enjoy the experience on game day. All right, kickoff between Texas and OU is set for 11 a.m. in Dallas. You can see that game live right here on KSAT 12 this Saturday. While the Texas Longhorns are back in the top 25, the Fighting Texas Aggies are out following back-to-back -back losses, including upset at home by Mississippi State 26-22. Now the Aggies have to go up against number one ranked and undefeated Alabama in College Station and in primetime, where they'll be 15 and a half point underdogs at Kyle Field, where they lost only four games in the Jimbo Fisher era. So how do you prevent unexpected back-to-back -back losses this season to penetrate the locker room before such a huge game against Bama this week? You block it out. Turn it off. Turn social media off. Turn y'all off. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean you you got to you got to lock into that that room and only in that room and the people and family and and understand that at the end of the day, listen, y'all are doing your job. Everybody everybody has their opinions. Everybody's doing their job. Quit. When you write something good, don't listen. When you write something bad, don't listen. Move on. Eliminate the clutter. Kickoff between A and M and Alabama on Saturday night in College Station is set for 7 p.m. This is a huge fork in the road for the Aggies this season. Well, this is the one way they turn their season around. That's the only way, I believe. Beat Bama. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. He is the man behind the Fairfax KSAT San Antonio Report poll. He is pollster Dave Metz with FM3 Research, and we are very happy to have Mr. Metz with us live here from California as we talk about the latest Bear Facts poll that was released just this morning. Dave, always appreciate you joining us uh, for kind of the debrief on what you found interesting in this poll. What's the, what are the headlines this time around, do you think? Well, I think there's a couple of things that stand out from the poll, Steve. Uh, the first is that local residents are still pretty happy with the way things are going in the community. We've got solid pluralities that see both the county and city is headed in the right direction and large numbers that continue to approve of the performance of local elected officials like the mayor and, uh, and Judge Wolf. Um, and there is no single issue, and we ask people to tell us what they see as the big problems facing Bear County, there's no single issue that really stands out as a, a dominant concern for them right now. Although there certainly are a number of issues about which they do uh, express some significant concern. In every poll, uh, you guys ask about what are things top of mind when it comes to issues they would like to see addressed by the city and the county. This poll really seemed to dive deeper into the issue of homelessness, asking questions about uh, what the people surveyed think are the causes of it, solutions. What was found there? Yeah, well, we see about three in five local voters tell us that they see homelessness as an extremely or very serious problem in Bear County. And that level of concern is high and has been pretty stable over the course of the last couple of years. Uh, in this poll, we asked people to indicate what they see as the major causes of homelessness in Bear County. And there was a broad consensus that mental health challenges and substance abuse issues are the major uh, factors that are involved. But we also saw that particularly among Democratic voters locally, uh, they recognized unemployment, medical crises, and the high cost of living as significant contributors. 
Uh, in contrast, we saw some Republicans a little more likely than others to say that personal choice was a factor uh, to people living uh, without housing. So there was broad recognition, though, across all parties that there it's not a it's not an easy problem to solve. There are a lot of factors that cause it and no single silver bullet solution that's available. I want to mention before I forget, Dave, that you at home, even if you weren't pulled in this uh, entire Barefax thing, you can still take the poll online at Barefax.org. You can take the exact poll that we uh, had out in the field, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, talk yeah. about mental health. It's been something that we have covered a lot in the news, uh, the effects of the pandemic and mental health. We've kind of found yeah. that that was an issue in this latest poll, correct? For sure. Uh, overall, about half of Bear County voters tell us that their mental health has been impacted over the course of the last 12 months by the pandemic. And we asked about seven specific impacts they might have experienced, everything from depression and anxiety to difficulty focusing or difficulty connecting with family and friends. And almost three quarters of voters in Bear County said they had experienced at least one of those mental health challenges over the last 12 months. Um, which uh, is a relatively high number compared to what we've seen in other locations around the country. Let's talk about some approval ratings that this poll looked at, uh, particularly Governor Greg Abbott. We know a lot of focus has been on what's been coming out of his office over the last several months in terms of, you know, not allowing mask mandates to be put in place, lawsuits, countersuits. So what did this poll find in terms of how people are approving of the job he's doing right now? Uh, well, it showed that there's a lot of skepticism toward the, the governor in, in Bear County. You know, the first time we pulled the governor's approval ratings was last April, right after the pandemic had started. And at that point, 70 percent of voters said they approved of the job he was doing right after the pandemic started. But with each successive poll, his approval rating has slipped uh, a bit in the county and it's hit a new low now with only 38 percent approving of his performance. I think a lot of the factors that lead to that are disagreements on issues of policy. Uh, as you noted, on issues like mask mandates, 74% of parents in our survey said they support continuing mask mandates in school. Uh, and we also saw strong opposition among Bear County voters to policies like allowing open or concealed carry without a license or training, and also to SB8, uh, where opposition was both broad and intense among Bear County voters. And that's like a lot of people will hear the approval ratings of the governor and say, well, you know, Bear County is a blue county, so of course they're not going to approve. But like you pointed out, April of 2020, his approval rating in the same poll was 70 percent plus. That's right. I mean, there was sort of a, a moment, I think, where uh, local voters were willing to view issues through a somewhat more bipartisan lens. But I think as time has passed and as a number of the policies the governor has pursued are ones that are winning strong approval from Republicans, um, but are strongly disapproved of by Democrats. It's meant that in a county like Bear County, uh, that has taken his approval rating back to a place where it's really just core Republican voters are, who are supporting him uh, with those on the left and in the center of the electorate viewing him more skeptically now. Outside of politics, the poll also looked at CPS Energy, the approval rating for the job that they are doing, as well as whether we are prepared in terms of infrastructure to handle the next storm that, that comes our way. So what did this poll find in terms of how people are viewing the utility? Well, this poll showed that just under half of Bear County voters, 44 percent, approve of the performance of CPS Energy. And that's about the same number that we saw in our March poll in the immediate wake of the winter storm. Uh, those numbers that we've seen in this year's polling are significantly lower than the approval ratings for CPS Energy last year, uh, when they were significantly higher, about two thirds of voters expressing approval. So it suggests that the winter storm has created some lasting impact on perceptions of CPS Energy. And it's probably gonna take a little while for uh, uh, their communication with their customers to uh, lead to a situation where it rebuilds some of those positive sentiments that uh, the utility uh, experienced before. Dave, before we let you go, obviously there's a lot in this poll. We're not gonna be able to cover it all in five or six minutes. Hopefully you can get it on barefax.org or ksat.com. Uh, but I wanna touch, touch briefly on one of the most interesting things I found, and it has to do with unemployment and the people that are looking for jobs and why they say what the major factors are in them not getting a job right now or not wanting to get a job right now. Yeah. 
Well, among those who said that they were planning to look for a new job uh, over the course of the, the coming months, and that was about one in five voters in our sample. Uh, the thing they said they found to be the biggest challenge toward getting a new job was finding work that had sufficient hours or paid enough um, to meet their goals. Uh, more than anything else, that was the thing that concerned them. But there were a few other items that stood out. Uh, there was also significant concern about the availability of childcare, with many workers saying that uh, struggling to balance responsibilities at work and caring for children uh, made it hard to find work that would fit that schedule. And that was particularly true for uh, those in our sample who had young children at home, especially mothers. All these questions, just a fraction of the ones that were asked. Like Steve mentioned, you can go to barefax.org to take this poll for yourself and dive further into all these results. Dave Metz, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Dave. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Some construction reminders again this evening. The lane closures overnight on Loop 1604 uh, between Bandera actually and I-10. I need to update that. Uh, that's overnights 9 to 5 a.m. in both directions. Looking at uh, travel times in the area now already seeing some delays westbound on 1604. 15 minutes uh, going from I-10 to Bandera Road. Only five minutes in the other direction. Also, again, this week overnight, the flyover ramps at 1604 and 281 will be closed. They're doing uh, some bridge work uh, in this area, so those ramps are going to have to be uh, closed. You can use the frontage roads as an alternative. Now, one issue we have on the west side uh, this evening is a Pretty big crash. This is Loop 410 uh, northbound at Highway 90. So you can see down to 16 miles per hour. And once again, when you see this gap here, that means uh, traffic is diverted. So there's no data there. Otherwise, I would show you travel time, but it would be inaccurate. Uh, this is the closest of you we have right now. This is Loop 410 at Ray Ellison. And you can see the sign there reminding folks ahead uh, of that crash. So if you're a Loop 410 on the west side around Highway 90, watch out for that this evening, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside with live cam. Plenty of heat out there today, but we're not joking when we say this. It's a it's a drier heat. Yeah, it's a dry heat. Exactly. It is. It makes well, it so it bad. <laughs> hey, we're running above average in terms of afternoon temperatures, but morning temperatures a little below average, at least for now. 88 degrees currently, but feels good with a dew point near 50. By 10 o'clock, we'll be in the mid 70s, midnight at 70. If you want to open your windows tonight, you can just keep in mind the allergens, mold, fall, elm, and ragweed are all elevated still. We'll be back to talk about how long this is going to last when the humidity returns. Coming up. After weeks, we have a winner and only one winner for the $700 million Powerball lottery. The single winning ticket sold in California. Six other tickets matched five white balls and will get prizes worth one to two million dollars. By the way, did you hear Kasky boo when you said it was sold in California? <laughs> for, for what it's worth, the winning numbers are 66, 12, 22, 54 and 69. The Powerball was 15. The lucky ticket holder can choose to get the money gradually or just take the lump sum cash option of four hundred and ninety six million dollars. The huge Ooh. payout comes after 40 weeks without a grand prize winner. 40 weeks. Four hundred and ninety six million dollars is your lump sum payment. Yeah, that, I mean, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> I guess you can do some Christmas shopping with that, right? Don't get your hopes up is all I'm saying, you know? You're the one booing that it was sold in California, only, like you bought a ticket and we're trying to play. Only because I rarely play and the friends I was with were okay. buying tickets. I'm like, yeah, I'll throw oh, in right. like 20 bucks, here. whatever. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. like I told my wife, you'd be better off taking that money, putting it in some kind of account, and you can make about 12% on it per year. Give it 25 years. You're not going to win the Powerball, but you'll be better off this way. So knowing all that... You still bought a Powerball ticket yourself as a group. No, a no, 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 no. I just want to clarify, knowing all that you know about twice a year, I do it. That's about it. Rather than, well, let's just do it more often. And nope, not doing it, honey. Nope. Okay. All right. Nope. Nope. Hmm. You're welcome. I just okay. did everybody a favor out there. Did you? <laughs> we know where you stand. So do what I you say, not what you do. do. Is that what it is? I know it's fun. To, okay. A couple times a year. <laughs> I don't expect to win, though. Okay. All right, low humidity. That's going to be until Sunday. Low humidity, kind of like your odds of winning Powerball. Actually, 
even better than your odds of winning Powerball. There you go, Myra. Thank you. Pleasant mornings. <laughs> Sunny and dry conditions are going to prevail. All right, let's take a look at the temperatures outside. Oh. My computer's acting funny. Okay, there we go. Let's take a look at the temperatures outside across the state. Mostly in the 80s, some in the 90s. And right now we're 79 in Marfa, so there's one of the cooler spots. 86 though, Junction, 85 Dallas, and for the most part, we've got some 80s. You get to Catula 94, whereas earlier Catula was 96. Del Rio's at 94. Those are the exceptions. Still running a little above average in terms of afternoon temperatures. But let's go to tomorrow morning. We'll be about 64 in Carrizo Springs, but 58 Canyon Lake, 56 in Kerrville. Bernie, 57 in the morning. Converse at 60 along with Lavernia. So fairly comfortable and pleasant conditions again for the day tomorrow, at least to start the day. You may want the long sleeves for the kids at the bus stop, but they won't need it in the afternoon. Morning conditions remain below average through Friday, even on into Saturday. Then those morning temperatures climb again. That's a direct result of more mugginess back in the air. When we add that moisture to the air, temperatures are prevented from falling off as much at night. So dew points right now, low to mid 50s, very pleasant and comfortable. That's going to be the rule all the way through Saturday, but then we get into Sunday and oh, the mugginess is back and it's going to be here uh, thereafter as we get into next week. Quiet on the satellite and radar across Texas, but we're basically surrounded and bookended by these disturbances. One over the desert southwest, giving uh, parts of Arizona, New Mexico and Utah some much needed moisture, but even some severe thunderstorms associated with that. The other one farther to the east of us near Memphis, and that's stirring up, of course, some showers and thunderstorms in the southeastern and mid-Atlantic portions of the U.S. So we're on the backside of this one in particular, the one near Memphis, and you see this red and orange on the screen indicating drier air aloft. This is translating to that abundant sunshine we've been having. And you look at our visible satellite, we've had a few fair weather clouds stream into the hill country this afternoon. They're brief, they're fizzling out, and that's it. Otherwise, tomorrow, more of the same. A lot of sunshine, upper 50s to near 60 in the morning, 91 by the afternoon, minimal breeze out there. Not much of a wind, light and variable. I mean, we're talking shifting around at about two to six miles per hour max. That really stays the same all the way through the end of the week. Highs in the low 90s, low humidity, a lot of sunshine. But when the humidity comes back on Sunday, we'll have those muggy mornings that are a little closer to 70 degrees and not as pleasant to be opening your windows. Okay, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning to you. It is Tuesday. It is October 5th. Residents heard gunshots near Henry Metzger Middle School over on the city's northeast side. Stephen Cavazos is live with why an investigation is now underway. Stephen? Hours earlier, parents and nearby residents were on high alert after gunshots were heard in the area, which led BCSO deputies and Judson ISD police to search for a suspect they originally believed was involved. Anywhere from 8 to 28 shots fired from a home in a Leon Valley neighborhood. That's what Leon Valley Police Chief David Gonzalez said neighbors told investigators that led to a standoff with police for over two hours. Just before 8 a.m., Chief Gonzalez says officers were in the area of the 7,000 block of Weathered Post Street. That's near Hebner and Bandera when officers heard those gunshots. Shortly after that, when they arrived to the home, Gonzalez says three men barricaded themselves inside. The chief says a county negotiator Negotiator arrived on scene and just after 10 a.m., three men surrendered and were taken into custody. This is what's left of a woman's car after she fell asleep at the wheel this morning. San Antonio police say despite the car bursting into flames, the woman is okay, adding she escaped with only a few bumps and scratches. Well, security cameras and doorbell cameras caught an unusual sight, a fireball coming right out of the sky. Yeah, there are about 41 people who saw the fireball reported to the American Meteor Society. Several of those folks said they also heard a big boom. It's unusual for such a large object, and I'm guessing that it was something on the order of a ton of rock. You know, it is that kind of an event of a lifetime, something, an amazing little piece of nature that you should relish having seen. <laughs> If you were wondering what's up with all the fruit at work today, it may have been because it is National Eat Fruit at Work Day. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty direct and to the point. Wow. It's marked every year on the first Tuesday in October. People are encouraged to pack fruit in their lunches, eat it as a snack at their desk, 
or try a new fruit-filled recipe. So it's the N-E-F-A-W-D. Just rolls right off the it tongue. It does. <laughs> this very specific day founded to promote the benefits of getting more fruit in your diet. It was created by a group called the Fruit Guys in 2000. There's even a Fruit Guys website. According to NationalDayCalendar.com, some people are so into National Eat Fruit at Work Day, they dress up as fruit <laughs> or wear fruit in some way. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Coming up right after this newscast, a brand new episode of KSAT Explains. Tonight, we're revisiting plans to upgrade the Alazon Courts, a historic public housing complex in the heart of the West Side, the oldest one in the country. We'll be talking about where those plans stand now and how those who call the courts home will be affected. Hundreds of families. Catch the KSAT Explains Los Courts live stream at 7 o'clock, KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app, or on our Facebook page. We'll post it on demand so you can watch it later in its entirety on our website a little bit later this evening. Myra, some major delays on the west side right now. This is a Loop 410 northbound. A couple of right lanes at last check closed just north of Highway 90. You see uh, traffic at a crawl uh, there, and you'll get plenty of warning here. This is Loop 410 at Ray Ellison uh, showing a signage with that delay there, so watch out for that, guys. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for joining us. Oh, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but wait, there's more. No, I'm busy eating more. fruit over here at work. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay, low humidity the rest of the week. <laughs> oh, my goodness is not. See on the night beat. <laughs> yeah.